Depression in Germany. Now, scientists, of course, around the world are racing to find an effective treatment for coronavirus. One area of research is looking at the oral polio vaccine, whether it might provide short term immunity to this infection. Let's talk to Dr. Robert Gallo, a world renowned virologist who, in 1984, helped discover the HIV virus and how it causes AIDS. He's now director of the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. We're very grateful to have uh, you here on our program. Program. Uh, you're talking about repurposing the oral polio vaccine for short-term treatment. What benefits would that actually have? I think that it could help to break the epidemic, the pandemic. I think if we applied it earlier, it would have been a significant help. That presumes, of course, that we're right that it will work. But the data that we know of from um, Soviet Union in the 1970s showed how this unrelated virus, polio, when it was given live, replicating, doesn't it's safe, um, just almost took away completely influenza, another RNA virus. And it's done by the innate immune system, not the typical thing that a specific long lasting vaccine will do, but our emergency response, which we don't know how long it lasts, but it's probably somewhere around eight, maybe 10 weeks or so, maybe a little longer, maybe significantly longer. This is a response that we have when we see a foreign molecule like an RNA that shouldn't be there. We have sensors for it. And the reaction includes interferon and was called by the Russians in the 1970s some kind of strange virus interference. They didn't know what was going on because it's not a specific response. So, so, not a so possibly you think it would give... Uh, a window of between eight and ten weeks that uh, potentially then becomes incredibly valuable in terms of other avenues. If uh, that is the hope, where are you with this in terms of getting it sanctioned? Yes, I, I will tell you. Uh, I, I just want to say also, we think giving it again could work again so that it might be extended to, let's say, three or four months. And so there's no evidence that you would stop working by giving it again. So where are we with it? Uh, we have uh, four places that are cooperating together. Uh, it is off for funding uh, to NIH right now. Uh, so the proposal is in. Uh, we have a paper in press in science that's a more formal scientific paper about it, which when it's published, uh, we hope within the next month, will give it more power and strength and push. Um, we are expecting that NIH will be fairly rapid on it. My colleague on this, my close co-worker on this, whose parents actually made the original discovery, his name is Konstantin Chumakov. He came to the United States where he directs the, he's associate director of the vaccine um, program of FDA. So the FDA people have already reviewed it. That doesn't mean we can guarantee rapid uh, approvals, but we feel confident about it. Just, uh, we've got collaborators. And just, then we think, believe it or not, that we're getting interest from Iran and uh, also from Russia. And so Just very, will... very briefly in terms of the timeline, because going back to HIV, you had that blood test fully developed in February 1984, but the test finally came in December of that year. You will know that the wheels can turn quite slowly in these types of areas. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The United States government at that time felt that this was super fast. And we were scratching our heads and thinking, why? But, you know, as scientists and physicians, but a physician like me who spends his time in experimental medicine and laboratory work, uh, for us it seemed a long time. But to realize to get that into a global operation requires tremendous coordination and it requires having the equipment across the world. And what happened was that Abbott Laboratories had a certain machinery set up across the world for diagnostics. We, we felt that we were going to need more than that. We needed two steps in it, and we were a little concerned. But Abbott went forward, and in fact, they were right to go forward because it saved a lot of lives. Then yep. the two steps were put into operation later. But you're right. It takes, it takes time. It can be frustrating. There's an awful lot of blood tests out there right now, and there's something good about some, very good about some, and some things not working as well as we'd like to see about several others. Let me let me rattle through three or four other areas. I'm very keen to get your thoughts on uh, the antibody test for COVID-19. First of all, how important is it that we get that test and get a reliable test? Yeah, I, I believe from the start that uh, that it's vital among the singular most important things, probably 
you know, people would obviously say, well, therapy and yes, a preventive vaccine, but of course those take time. But you really need to have the blood test and it has to be accurate. It can't have too many false positives because you have to have it for tracking. A lot of people were saying, yes, it'll also tell us that we are immune. It certainly does not tell us that. Antibodies can be nothing at all. I mean, neutral in, in behavior for us biologically and medically, or they can be helpful. And sometimes, uh, let's hope not in this case, they can be even a bit detrimental. You so think it's still an open it's possibility. possibility? You think it's an open possibility that we could catch this twice? Because that is really important when we, we hear and read about things like immunity passports and enabling people to go back to work and to travel and all of those sorts of things. There is the answer is do I believe that can happen twice? I believe it's a very real possibility, and I believe there's some data that suggests it does happen. Some people have reported it, some people have criticized it, but there's a, I think, a powerful molecular virological paper. Uh, that comes from actually your country mainly, from Sh Sheffield University, along with collaborations with Los Alamos in America and Duke University, yep. that shows that recombinant viruses are appearing. And, you know, that means there had to be another one. So they recombined and formed different sequences. So it suggests strongly that you are getting infected, at least in the cases that they found these recombinant strains, that the, in, within the same cell even. So I'm very concerned about that, yes. So we don't, we've got to get the right kind of vaccine, the right kind of antibodies, the right kind of killer T cells. That's going to take time unless we're very lucky and we're, get it right off the bat. We're nearly out of time, but I want to ask you a twin final thought, if I could. Uh, the, the reinfection rate or the reproduction rate getting a lot of focus at the moment. We heard the UK uh, talking about a range between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9. Is there any value at a number like that when it is that vague or that broad or does it need to be more specific and a question about vaccines are we making a dangerous assumption that at some stage or other the vaccine will come because when you look at uh, hiv we have therapies but of course we don't still have a vaccine you're right you're you're right on both uh, but in terms of the number i'm not the best person in, uh, to really interview for that because I, I have never worked with, with that in a public health epidemiology fashion. But you can imagine that we don't have ac ac really precise data yet altogether. And you can imagine that we're going to be behind the curve in what those numbers mean, the variation in day-to-day in -day reporting, the, it, it, too, much, too much vagary in it. So I can't imagine that this is uh, precise in, in any way. Now, a consistently rising number over a period of time would, would be scary. In, in terms of a vaccine, yeah, you're right. I, I like to say when people give estimates of a vaccine, we're giving estimates for candidates, not for a vaccine. You have a vaccine when you have one, when you prove it, when it's safe and it's efficacious. You know, so we assume we can get one because it's a relative, you know, these acute viruses are usually simpler. Usually that, those are the viruses we succeed in getting vaccines against. Yet um, there are some of these viruses that it is hard to get the vaccine and sometimes the vaccine makes matters worse so we have to be a little gingerly yep. about this it's going to take time doctor yeah. we've run out of time but thank you so much for being with us here no, on bbc welcome, world Bert. news we thank really appreciate it thank you very much thank you. Right. Bye.